Welcome back to Builder's Journey on the Club Pod. I'm stoked to be back, bringing you stories and learnings from our Accelerator alumni. I'm Nicole, co-creator at Seed Club. In this first episode of our new season, I sat down with Jonathan Mann, aka Song A Day Man, aka the founder of Song A Dow. It turns out we'd been in the same music crypto circles for over five years on similar tracks, though just connected in the last year, so it was cool to look back over our shared history. We explored the genesis of Song A Dow, including early inspiration for the Dow, as well as its start in the last bear market cycle and what current builders might learn from his experience. We discussed the power inherent in creating something daily and shared some of the very cool community and technical experiments that are happening right now and in the future of Song and Dao. We had lots to talk about, and it was the perfect way to kick off this season. Jonathan. Hi. Thank you for being here. Hi. Yeah. Hello. I feel like there shouldn't be anyone in Web3 who doesn't know who you are, but just in case somebody has been under a Web3 rock, would you mind introducing the person that is Jonathan Mann and tell us a tidbit about Song Adao. Yeah, the person that is Jonathan Mann is me. I am known for having written a song a day for almost 14 years now. I was very early adopter slash interested in NFTs. And after a long and arduous journey, finally was able to launch my, my sort of dream NFT project this year which culminated in the creation of something called Song Adao, which is a, well, Bass actually described it recently as an exit to community, which I think is actually a really great uh, description of it. It was a way for me to take the 14 years of Song A Day that I've done and find a way to make that sort of worthwhile monetarily through the people, not through VCs and not through banks or a loan or anything, but just through people who wanted to buy the NFTs of the songs and become part of what's called Song Adao. Yeah, and not, I mean, you're a musician amongst many other hats. And so, yeah, not through a label, not through any sort of those traditional models either. So I'm super excited to discuss your builder's journey and really grateful for you coming on here. Loved that you were one of the projects that came through SEO4 and that we got to connect more deeply. So I know that you have been at this Web3 thing back when it was called blockchain and crypto without going into perhaps the entire (laughs) journey, because I know it's multi-year. Can you share a little bit about when you first started to think of like, okay, there's probably something here that resonates with me as an artist, as a musician within Web3 or, you know, back when it was blockchain. Yeah. And I think that you and I actually entered the scene, entered the picture around the same time, although I don't think we knew each other back then, but I knew of the projects that you were working on back then, the open music stuff. But uh, yeah, so I think my story is relatively typical of any artist in those days that came on board in that, you know, I wasn't very interested in crypto. In fact, I would say my attitude towards crypto was that of a skeptic, like all the skeptics are now, just like, ah, it feels kind of scammy. It feels kind of like finance bro. Like, what is there that's even remotely interesting? Through a series of fortunate events, I was introduced to CryptoPunks like a few months after it launched. And and it was the CryptoPunks project that captured my imagination. And it was pretty like simple. It was like a, for some reason, it was like a simple leap in my mind back then to look at CryptoPunks and like look at Song A Day and be like, these two things have a lot in common and I want to do what they've done, but with my Song A Day project. And so that was like, that was my entry into the world. And, you know, just as anyone does anytime they get crypto pilled or whatever, like, I sort of dove in headfirst and we were just coming at the sort of the tail end of the peak ICO mania. So I was sort of witness to the collapse, to the sort of like implosion of of all of that. I have to say like for like the year and a half or two years that I was like trying to build Song of Day back then, like the idea of a bear market, like I didn't really even understand that we were in a bear market (laughs) because it felt so exciting to me, you know, like I didn't have any money invested or I didn't have any money yeah. In the ecosystem. So it was all the same to me. It was like the price is here or the price is there. It didn't matter because it was just so exciting. It felt 
I mean, I'm sure you remember, like, everyone says this, right? It's like, ah, back in my day. But, like, <laughs> it was really special. It felt really special to me, you know, like, the number of people that were into what was called crypto art back then before mm. NFTs was very small. And we were like very, very tight knit community. I feel like I knew literally everyone that was into it personally. Like we talked to each other, maybe even met in New York and stuff. So yeah, it was a really great time. It was a long journey to get the Song of the NFT project made. It was a lot because the space just needed to mature some before I was able to make it work. Thank you so much for that. There's so many pieces there that I'm eager to pick up. I think first of all, it's really fun to think about all of the ways that paths crossed or almost crossed back then. And just Sherry from Water and Music and I know that we were both in the same room back in 2015 for this event that I helped organize oh, wow. for Rethink <laughs> Music. This very memorable, yeah. tense event, which was, I think, one of her first covering music and Web3 blockchain. And, and yeah, I don't know that our paths ever crossed, but I think it's really fun to think back to that and then to kind of think for the builders currently and for the people that are just entering now that that's mm-hmm. happening again and that you know all of yes, you out absolutely. there are, are colliding and crossing paths and you don't realize that in a couple of years when you stick with it you're going to have these deep connections a you're going to get to meet in person you're going to remember like oh we were both at this thing we didn't know each other and, you know you look back and you see pictures and it's like oh that was a really weird event but like there's these two people that now I get to see all the time, those pieces are really special. I think the other piece that I wanted to kind of pull on is that the fact that it has been a long journey as far as you seeing the promise of that going through the cycle. And here we are, at, I mean, you and I, I think are similar in that we're not financially engaged in the last crypto winter. And so we didn't feel the pain in the ways that others did. I think that we more felt it from the artist slash experimental side of things where it continued to feel exciting. But you know, we're at the beginning of some type of slowdown winter bear. So I think that that piece to me is really interesting as well as far as you became aware of something, you continued to explore it through whatever slowdown there was. And then as this next cycle emerged, you were there ready to launch things a and and, you know, I think be the sort of collective understanding and the technology had also caught up. What were some of the practices specifically that you were doing in those times that you felt helped you then be at that moment. That's, you know, once there was that convergence again of like, okay, your understanding, your desire, and also the ecosystem generally. Well, I'm not like a, I'm sort of an introvert. And so like one big thing was I just like went to every event. I was just Mm. like, I was out like every night, which is very unlike me. (laughs) And so it was, that's really what it was, was like, I just made such good friends with all of these people. It was in New York. And so I, and I was in Jersey city right across the river. And so it was like, I was just constantly every night at a different event with the same people. We were talking about the same stuff where it was all new as different people were working on things. I was just always aware of like what everyone was doing and like one thing sort of would always lead to another, which is sort of how I've always found my career, which is like, it's always been that the path is really windy and circuitous, but like you can trace every single thing back to like the thing before it and be like, Oh, like, I was able to do that because this happened and like, so that's really what it was. I think like ultimately it was just, I was so hyped on it. I was like so excited by it that it was like enough to like get over my hurdle of introvertedness and be like, (laughs) okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to see everybody all the time. And it was a blast. It was great. That I think more than anything, actually, especially Mm -hmm. through what was the bear market was like, we just continued to hang out. We continued to like try stuff. Yeah. And as your knowledge was leveling up, so were those relationships and those connections or as we say at Seed Club, the sense making network. So obviously you are very much the sort of prominent figurehead of Song Adao and main person that sort of propels that forward. What does your leadership team look like and how did that team evolve and who else do you work with to push forward the DAO? It's just sort of evolved naturally based on who is around. I feel really lucky to have like the people around that I do. My friend Matt, actually, who's not into crypto at all, I told him about the project. He's someone who I've been in bands with in the past and is just like a a musician friend of mine. I asked him if he would want to take 
on the responsibility of helping me push forward and just basically be the point person for the thing a day piece mm. that I have of Song a Dao, which is like where people each month, we have this cohort of people that will come in and make something every day for the month. And then at the end of the month, they get a Song a Day NFT, which is the thing that you need to join the DAO. And so he like, he's just totally taken that on himself. Like he did all of the work in terms of like standing it up and like, we're still figuring out like exactly how... You know, we're still working on it. Like we flirted with Mochi a little bit and like figuring out like what they're using. Hmm. And then there's been some developers that popped up in the DAO that now have sort of become our core dev team that are there. And then there's also just like folks from other projects that are more or less involved. This guy, Adam Stallard, who is the founder of Bright ID, who I think like became exposed to it via our use of Bright ID. But then he turned into like a big fan of Song A Day he actually is the number three holder of Song of Day songs. He owns 80 Song of Day songs, which is pretty amazing. Nice. And he's been super active and super helpful in like both with getting Bright ID up and running in the DAO and then also just bringing in tons of crazy cool ideas. It's been very organic, I would say, in terms of like who's been showing up and lending a hand. I think that's interesting and perhaps a bit unique in that it does put a lot of pressure, which I'm sure you feel from time to time on you sort of as this one person sort of holding that torch and, and bringing it forward. And it sounds like you've got a ton of great folks that are sort of emergently stepping up in different areas. I think like you in particular, with the daily practice that you've made are an interesting person to ask this, because there's other obviously daily practices that you've also cultivated over many years. But how do you balance these leadership responsibilities of vision and execution, and then supporting your team and community as well? Yeah, it's been really tricky. And I don't feel like I've completely figured it out. In the very beginning of the DAO, like the DAO launched on January 1st, like let's say technically, it's been like quite a journey in terms of, especially in the beginning, I felt like it's been hard to like make other people feel like they're as invested as I am mm -hmm. in the DAO, just sort of natural. But that's sort of changed, I think, over time a little bit, you know, like, as like people have taken on different roles and they've, you know, just figured out what's comfortable for them. Like everything I would say has just been very organic in how it's happening. I found that like, I can't really push it one way or the other. I've always been like a logistics person. So that side of it is not so difficult for me, seeing what needs to be done and just mm -hmm. kind of like logisticking my way through it, you know, and assigning things to people that, that can be assigned things and, moving each project forward as as needed um even with you know song a day on top of that i think like the pieces that we're still missing are like business side of things my wife has been taking on that a little bit but like everything from making sure that like from a legal point of view we, we have all of our ducks in a row and then mm -hmm. and then especially like from an accounting point of view that stuff has been maybe predictably been a little bit slower on the uptake cuz it's not exciting <laughs> and it's not like yeah. <laughs> it's not it's not uh it's necessary but not interesting um yeah. i like to think like maybe eventually like somebody will will wander through for whom like that is their sort of bread and butter like that is their their thing and and then we would sort of jump on that and grab them and and have them have them do stuff shout out accountants hit jonathan up yeah i think that you know they are out there and we love them we love you accountants yes and um <laughs> hit us up yeah we found an accountant who who does he's a co he specializes in co-ops because Sangha Dao is a legal co-op. And so, mm. but he's very, very new to DAOs, like in the last four months. I told him like, if you are co-op lawyer and now you're interested in DAOs, even if it's only been for four months, you are literally like, like an expert. You're the, you're the, you're probably you're like, you're one of probably like a handful of people who, who fit yeah. that bill. And so we had this whole discussion about like, he explained to me like how normal co-ops work. He works with a lot of like agriculture co-ops. I think that this other piece of like, what is it that you make? You originally came together, you've been making a song a day for many years. You had turned these into NFTs and we're starting to put those out into the world and people were excited about them. 
And then you had this idea that there was some power in bringing people together around this. And so I would love to hear how that has evolved from baseline, like this is something that I've done that I'd like for people to be able to share. And now that those people have come together, what other types of experiments is your community starting to run? You spoke about thing a day, but I'd, I'd love to hear like A, about what that evolution has looked like and then if there's other projects as well. It's interesting, like figuring out like what is the purpose of this DAO is a very is a very interesting question. And early on, there were people who would come to me and be like, hey, like, have you thought about making Song a Day into a DAO? And it never really made sense to me sort of until, and I've said this many times, but until I saw both the George Howard led project of Song That Owns Itself, where the idea was to create a DAO that owned the rights to a song and could collect the royalties for a song and that they would belong to the DAO. And then also Nouns DAO, where the NFT itself is the entry point into the DAO. Once I saw those, I sort of started to brainstorm and think, you know, my original conception, I think, of Song and DAO was that maybe that people could essentially like get paid It's essentially like making your fans your label. Whereas instead of having a label to do all the stuff of like get your music out there and help other people hear it, your fans can do that. And then the money that you would be giving to the label, you just give to your fans. And this isn't exactly what's happened, but the way I imagined it was like, Song of Dow makes money by me selling Song of Day songs and by the secondary royalties that they earn. That money would go back to everyone in the Dow for the different things that they did in order to help Song of Day be heard. And maybe someday that will be it. What it's turned into more is not the part of the label that would like help me get my music out, but like the part of the label that would like help me do weird experiments, basically, is what it's turned into. Is like the DAO seems to be forming around this idea of we're going to make weird things around Song a Day that we think are cool and sort of see what happens. Aside from Thing a Day, we haven't launched any yet, but like we have a couple coming down the pike that are pretty neat. And the way that they get funded is we have these weekly meetings, like me or someone else will bring something up, an idea, we'll talk about it, we'll kind of flesh out the idea, and then... I'll write up a proposal based on those ideas and we all vote on it of like whether of like, here's how much ETH we're going to spend on it. Should we spend this ETH to give this person to make it, etc. Yeah, that's like essentially what Song of Dao has become thus far is like a vehicle to bring to life cool, interesting web three experiments around Song of Day. Well, yeah. And like, I think that you mentioned George and so I'll, I'll mention him as well. Hey, George. We would do a bunch of sessions with teens during the summer for various high school programs. And one of the, I think, the most effective, and I loved that he did it in particular with young people because so much of being young is feeling weird, but not wanting other people to know that you're weird. And then like Mm. feeling like worried that you're weird. Recently in the Discord, in the Seed Club Discord, somebody was talking about how do you grow your community? You know, I'm at the beginning where I want to write about this thing. And it's, it's a super cool project. I've gotten to meet with the founder, Fire Lily, I think is the name. And they're interested in basically kind of doing a a whole earth catalog, but like a current version of where are these collisions between humans and the internet and, and what is the impact currently on us. And so and doing this whole like writing experiment, the challenge they were having was around traction. And the question was basically, how do you start to get that traction. I think that what you're discussing is kind of these two pieces. One, the first one is the traction. And then the second one is what do you make out of it? The sort of advice that I gave was, you know, A, in Seed Club, we talk about your call to adventure. First, you need to know what your call to adventure is. And then the advice that George had given these teens that that really stuck with me was embrace that freak flag and then fly the freak flag. Your ability to do yeah. that is sort of uniquely you. Nobody can can right. fly yours like that's uniquely who you are and that's what gives what you're building this purpose and this edge and so once you do that and you do it consistently and you find different ways to put yourself out there that's when people are going to start to assemble i think like then what do you do with that is is a whole other level i'm curious like you've been doing this over many years i love that like letting your freak 
Flag Fly because that's like that's almost what Song of Day is. That's what just every day Song of Day has been for me. It's like here I am. Like this is the kind of songs that I write. This is what I'm doing. Like come hang out with me, you know. And so Song of Dao is like the, a culmination of that freak flaggedness, I would say. And so I think that the other piece is very interesting. And I think that this is such a, a Web3 question when we look at business model, because I'm sure at some point somebody's asked you like, what is the Song of Dao business model? Yeah, yeah. I'd be curious how you answer that question. I also see this evolution. I mean, I think you said first, like you saw that it was going to be this label that was supporting the songs. How has your understanding of that evolved? In the attention economy, it's just like you have to try whatever you can basically to like get people to pay attention to what you're doing. And Song of Day has been really good at that in some ways and not so good in that in other ways. Song of Dao, I think in some ways is an attempt to like most of the things that we're trying to do have to do, I think, with framing Song a Day in a new light, like framing it in a different way. Making it into NFTs does that, right? It frames it in a different, completely new way. Releasing it every day as an NFT does that. It puts a new container around Song a Day. In a lot of ways, like Song a Day is, it's very hard to consume for most people. Like most people have a hard time watching every day that's never been something that's been easy to do it's not like you know i think like an advantage that someone like people has for instance right is that when you're scrolling through instagram which is where i usually see his images it goes by and boom there you're done you saw it you know a song and a video you kind of have to like take time out of your day and find a moment one of the things we're working on came came directly inspired from some, something that Song Camp did in Chaos in their latest project, which I think was like attempting to solve the same problem, actually, because, you know, Chaos resulted in these 75 songs. You know, they have the same problem. How are you going to have people listen to all these songs? That's a lot of songs to listen to. And one of the things that they did that, that I thought was so brilliant and obvious in retrospect is they made this really fun collection challenge that makes it so that you can see which songs you've already collected. And so you want to listen to the ones that you collected because those are the ones you have, right? But then you're also like incentivized really just out of like the human need to collect things and to like completion things to like collect the other songs. And then as you collect them, you're going to listen to them. It's a really wonderful mechanism. So that's one of the things that we've been working on is like a really hopefully fun and interesting way that we incentivize collecting of the songs, which we think will then translate into people actually listening to them. I appreciate like a the inspiration from other projects that are out in the ecosystem and also the emergence of, you know, room for experiments. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about thing a day as well. It's a great example of flying the freak flag, putting out the call to adventure. You bring the folks together. You don't necessarily know what these people are going to have in common or what they're going to want to do together. And then you see something grow out of it. And so talk to us a little bit more about what thing a day is. It's been great. We're in the seventh month of this year. And each month we've had a cohort between like two and five people, I think five people is the max that we've had so far, making different types of art every day. So we've had people doing, like obviously doing songs a day. We've had people doing TikToks a day. We had young Spielberg do a word a day where he picked 30 of his favorite words and he made a little video explaining the definition of like where and why it's his favorite word, which was really creative. We've, we've had like doodles a day, many different kinds of art made every day. At the end of the 30 days or the month, they get to pick a song a day that's like in the Song of Dao treasury to be their song that they can then join the Dao with. The initial sort of reason for this was that I wanted the Dao to be accessible to everybody. And, you know, song a days, even now when ETH is so low, you know, typically they're anywhere from like 30 to $200 these days normally. And so that's still a lot of money for a lot of people, especially to spend on something like a like a digital collectible. I wanted a way for people to earn. There's like a lot of talk, right, about incentives in Web3. It's like incentivizing this and 
How do we coordinate and incentivizing that? One way that we do that is through putting skin in the game. Like, you know, that the idea behind token-based voting is that, you know, the people that have the most tokens, well, yeah, it just so happens that they're very, they could be very wealthy, but they have so many tokens and so their incentives are gonna be aligned with the more tokens you have, the more incentivized you are to like make sure the product does well, I think it's like the basic idea. But, uh, you know, there's other ways to align incentives. And so it's like, well, if they made a thing for a day, every day for a month, they'll know what that feels like and they'll sort of be in the club or whatever, you know, in the song a day, cl- in the thing a day club. And then, you know, that's enough of an incentive alignment to say like, yes, they, they can now, they, they totally have earned this song a day and now can become part of the, part of the crew. I love that for so many reasons. I'm generally just a fan of aligned incentives. And I think that there's a lot of power there, but also it's kind of this meta thing because somebody who's familiar with the artist's way and just the general practice of daily creation yeah. Um, the thing that you're having them do, it's not just like, oh, okay, like do this thing that's that's painful <laughs> and hard, but do this thing that's yeah. also transformative. Yeah. Like I think that like that's what's so incredibly powerful and interesting is like at the end of a month of doing that, like you're also a changed and improved human. So those totally. people that you're coming in have sort of this extra level of superpower unlock. Yeah, that's that's the beautiful thing about that. And you know, there's like the world is so full of people like trying to sell you change your life or like mm-hmm. do this <laughs> and it's going to be transformative. But like but really like making a thing every day really is that. It like really yeah. is. Like you do that for a month and especially for someone for a creative person, it could totally change your relationship to to making things like it's it's pretty it's pretty wonderful i guess the other sort of side of the pendulum with these daily creations and the volume you were talking about the volume can be overwhelming and i think certainly within music nfts hashtag music nfts there's that consumption challenge that uh images don't have so for sure but just generally at scale when there's tremendous amount of production curation becomes really important. And I think that that's kind of been the other side of the pendulum that we've been seeing, like certainly again within music, but I think generally with all of the production that we've seen within NFTs and Web3. And so has curation entered the conversation at all within Song Dao, and how is that working? So that's the other main project that we've been working on. It's called Song Dust. It's based on the idea of a token curated registry, which again is like an idea from from back in the day that sort of had a moment and then went away and I'm trying to bring it back. I think it's back. Yeah, yeah. I I think people are very ready. I think everyone is like super ready for it to happen. And the way we're sort of framing it, it like makes the curation process sort of a game. It's still a little ways away from being released, but the general idea is like, in the first iteration that we're gonna do, I'm gonna choose some categories of songs. And I haven't chosen them yet, but like for instance, like songs that I wrote in a hotel room or like songs about four-legged animals or like I'm gonna choose these categories and then people will be basically invited to use the explore page on songaday.world, which is which has gotten really good. Our devs have gotten a, have done a great job about like making it super searchable to like find different songs. You can type in like dog and it'll bring up every dog song and you can type in like hotel and it'll show you every song I did in a hotel. And what you do is we're gonna give you a little bit of what's called song dust. And you're going to go to like a faucet, you know, like you would to get test net, ETH or whatever. Rinkaby, you're going to go to a faucet and you're going to get some song dust from the faucet. You use the song dust. It's your token that you use to say, I've listened to a bunch of these songs. Here's the one that I think is the best. And the sooner you do that and the more early you are to a song that lots of people agree with, you sort of earn song dust in the background over a period of time. So like, let's say I choose the song that I did in Prague in a hotel room, and I say that that's the best song, and I stake some of my song dust to that song to say that. Over a period of time, if people agree with me and they stake their song dust, I will earn rewards in song dust as, and it's like the song dust, 
we're just going to be giving it away at first. Yeah. But it actually is, it's a real token. It's a song token that comes from the NFTX vault. This is where it gets really complicated. But suffice to say that there's something called NFTX, which is a protocol where you put in an NFT of some kind. In our case, our vault is Song of Day songs. You put in a Song of Day song and you get in return a song token. It's just an, a regular ERC-20 token that's a song token. And now you can trade that token at any time for any other song that's in the vault. You can put this, you can give your song token back and take any other song that's in the vault. So you, if you see a song that's in the vault that you want more than your song, you could put your song in the vault, get a song token, and then put and then use the song token to get back the song that you actually want that's that's in the vault. So we're taking one of these tokens, I don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but we're going to take one of these tokens and just, you know, little pieces of it, sprinkle them as song dust, like to, to different people, you know, and that's what you're going to use to vote. I think like eventually in the game of song dust, you could earn enough song dust that would make an entire song token that you could then trade in for a song. I think that's eventually what will happen. The first round is going to be very experimental and like figuring out what works and what doesn't and stuff. That's like where we're at so far. Maybe a first question I have is I want to chat about in-game currency because my soon-to-be nine-year-old is the person who in a lot of ways I can speak to a lot like within my family the most about a lot of this Web3 stuff because he's very familiar with in-game currencies and lore and world building. I find what you're doing with this connection, like everything that you just said has been done before in video games. I'm curious, like, what are some of the skills as far as like narrative and and gaming and, and sort of some of the mindsets that you've brought into not just the technology, but like how you make the technology exciting and and something that people want to do that's where the iterative part comes because i I think like what i know from game makers is that you create like a you know like a minimum viable thing and then you get it in people's hands as soon as possible Mm. because you need to see like what's compelling and what's not you need to like see like what is fun and where the fun lives so that's sort of how we're approaching it like we don't know i think we know enough basically to to know that we don't know like what's gonna be fun and how it's gonna be compelling really this first round that we're doing we're trying to get it done just as soon as possible so that we can just sort of learn from it. The idea is that at the end, we're going to have like a listening party of all of the songs that win, essentially. Like there'll be five winners. There'll be one song from each category. And we'll just have a listening party. And maybe people who nominated those songs will get some sort of extra prize or something. To answer your question, though, like, yeah, we don't know. I think it's like you've got to iterate. You've got to like try it. OK, that didn't work. That really didn't work. This kind of worked. Like, let's move forward on that path and like and see see how we can do it. It's so powerful. And the piece of getting it out into, you know, again, it's not until you tell the story and then you hear it reflected back and you say, okay, people didn't understand, you know, people understood how to exchange a song, but maybe they didn't understand what the connection was then from that into Stardust, for example. And so you hammer out those next pieces. One thing we know from TCRs from the last round is like the hard part is like getting people to do it. Like the hard, like (laughs) there was a lot of like really cool TCRs that happened last time, but like no one would use them, you know? And so that is really like, that is the trick is like, how do you make it something that's fun? How do you make it something that's compelling that people want to do and will take time? A great example of this is the stuff that, that Cool Cats has been doing, like, they've released like a whole game to me like it's compelling in one sense but i wouldn't call it fun it was like not fun to do it's like super cool and technologically amazing and really neat as a first attempt and i haven't looked at it in a while maybe they've improved it a bunch but like essentially it was just a lot of like you were earning this token called milk but you were just kind of like hitting a button that rolled some dice that Mm. did some stuff over and over and over and over again. Now, 
Some people love that. Like some people love like Farmville, which essentially I was thinking of Fishville and Farmville. Just like click, 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 you know. Now some people love that, but like for me, for it to be elevated, it needs to have like a couple other mechanics and a couple other layers of things of like, what can I do, you know? And I think I'm imagining, I'm starting to imagine like a thing around Song of Day where it's like, where there's things to do. This collection challenge that we're working on is like a thing you can do. Song dust is a thing you can do. And if we can like make them compelling enough, then suddenly there's this ecosystem of things that you can like participate in. And then if we can start connecting all of them together, you know, then it becomes something even bigger, hopefully. And because you're not doing it in isolation anymore, because you're doing it with a community, there's that sort of added much more immediate feedback loop. Oh, yeah, it's it's a whole different story. Yeah. Well, there's one other piece that I wanted to ask about, and it's a bit going back to the very beginning of this year of January 1st. And this is around your launch. I think that this is a piece that projects spend a lot of time doing. And often you watch somebody else's launch and you're like, oh, this is so fun. This is amazing. And you often don't see all of the work in the background, all of the many months of, of preparation. And so I'd love for you to chat a little bit about how you thought about your launch and um, how you prepared for it leading up to it and, and what were some of the key success factors that, you know, looking back now with the hindsight of six plus months. It was a long, you know, like I said, like from a certain lens, like five years would be from the moment I had the idea to the moment I launched it. It changed so many times throughout that, like how exactly it was going to look. In March of 2021, I released like one year of Song A Day, the first year, on OpenSea, on like OpenSea's shared storefront contract. And we launched with them being at 0.1 ETH. There was no Song A DAO. And it sold out like instantly. And so I was like, great, this is this is amazing. This is how we're going to do it. And so my plan at that point was that I was going to do every couple months, I was going to do another, I was going to release another year's worth until I was caught up. And then when I was caught up, I would do just every day like I am doing now. And I was going to raise the price too. The idea was that year one was going to be 0.1, year two is going to be 0.12, year three, 0.13. It's a little complicated. Maybe not so good. But so then what happened was that I got to the point of releasing year two in May. So two months later, and it did not sell out like 50 out of 365 sold on the first day. And it took literally six months or seven months of a slog of me like constantly like trying to get people to buy these songs for it to finally sell out. And so after that experience, I was like, well, shit, that totally screws with my plan of doing this once every couple months of every year like this is not going to be sustainable so then i pivoted to the idea of doing one big launch Hmm. that was going to be years three through 13. on january 1st of 2021 i started with this idea maybe i'll i'll start on january 1st of 2021 and release a song a day but like the old songs it made no sense I was, I was like, on January 1st of 2021, I sold song number one from 2009. And on January 2nd of 2021, I sold the second song. And I was like, maybe this is a, but then that quickly was like, okay, that's not going to be the right way to do it. And then I went to this year to time thing and I was like, okay, that's not going to be the way. So then I went, okay, I'm putting all my chips on this idea of like, we're going to do one big launch on December 31st, which is like an auspicious day for Song A Day because it's like a transition point from one year of Song A Day to another year, which is why we chose that day. It was an insane amount of work. I hired this DAO called Raid Guild to Mm. do all of the custom contracts and all of the website design and everything. I mean, they were amazing. I used the money from the first year's drop along with the money that I made from this other project called the fucking trolls to fund the creation of this stuff. Cause it's not cheap to hire a bunch of devs to do a bunch of kinds of things. So leading up to the 31st, like, you know, it's so scary. Like I empathize with anyone 
who is launching a project because it's terrifying. You don't know how it's going to go. I had no idea. It was New Year's Eve. I was like, this is either brilliant or stupid to do it on New Year's Eve. Like no one else is going to do a drop on New Year's Eve. No one's dumb enough to do it. I've told this story before in various places, but I think it bears repeating, which is like, it did sell out instantly or, or more or less instantly. And I was very grateful and very amazed that it happened. The caveat is that a big portion of who purchased the songs were, you know, what I affectionately call DGENs, right? They were mm. flippers. They were people who mm. thought maybe this project would be like a quick 10x or something you know it would be and they you know they didn't read the website they didn't they didn't care what they yeah. were minting they did they just aped in because a bunch of like high profile collectors mm -hmm. aped in you know were, were buying that was great for the short term of selling out and having that narrative that was great but for like the medium term it was pretty rough because, you know, what the DGENs do is they immediately start selling for a loss. It's sort of practice that I still don't understand. So bottom line is what I tell everybody, you know, who's launching, especially an NFT project. I mean, I'm less familiar with like things with, you know, where it's some other kind of token. But I always say, like, don't worry if you don't sell out. If you believe in the project and you can get like a bunch of people who also believe in the project to buy in a slow sellout that is from people who really believe in the project, I think in the end is more valuable than a fast sellout with people that don't believe in the project. The example I always give is Crypto Coven, I think is the perfect example mm, where it's like it took seriously, like yeah. six or seven months for them to sell out, but it was all people who like really loved it, you know? And so, yeah. yeah. Well, truly I can't think of a better place and, and comment on which to end because I think that it kind of comes back to the very beginning of, you know, finding that call to adventure and flying your freak flag. Jonathan, thank you so much for sharing your builder's journey. It was really fun to catch up and to learn about some of the cool, exciting things that you're doing. My pleasure. So final question, where can we find you to keep up with all of the great things you're building? Yeah, I'm most active on Twitter. So song a day man. And if you'd like to purchase a song, they're currently quite cheap thanks to the DGENs on OpenSea. So you can find the OpenSea by by going to songaday.world and that's that you'll find all the links there. Amazing. Such a pleasure. Thank you.